Um, it's going to be very practical based. Um, what I'm going to present to you is what I've looked at, studied, learned over 14 years as a strength and conditioning coach. I've worked in four different academies with four different sports. Um, as Liam said recently, I've moved from professional rugby, Munster rugby, coming back from a senior World Cup and a junior World Cup to working with the under nines and under 16s up to under 16s at Arsenal. So it's been a full cycle. It's been everywhere. And um, certainly been very, very, very interesting, interesting development, very interesting uh, pathway for me. Uh, currently, I head up 155 kids. I'm in charge of three staff. Um, I lead the strength and conditioning programs for 153 under nines, under 16s, academy players at Arsenal. So that sounds glamorous, it sounds sexy, it's professional football. But what I want to present to you guys today is the, the methods, terminologies, the, the stuff that I've learned over the last 14 years that you can apply to any athlete at any level. Trust me, an under nine South London kid is the very same as an under nine Mayo little footballer, okay? It's all the same. They're, they're boys at the end of the day, or girls. Um, yes, I have fantastic facilities at work. I have access to the latest technology at work. I want to show you guys today, you'd be actually, I think, surprised how simple it is what we do. But what we do is we do it consistently and we do it well. I think that's what people forget. People get hung up on technology. Technology is good. Um, research is good. Learning is good. That's why we're all here today. That's why you're doing fantastic courses like Sedanta College. But if you don't do your basics right, that is my key coaching philosophy. Do your basics, get them right. Continually, continually work on them. Liam will tell you, one of my strongest attributes is the coaching. Um, I don't get hung up on science. Yes, what I do is research, is underpinned by research. But the biggest thing I do is I coach. I constantly, constantly coach. Um, whether it's 25, nine-year-olds or the World Cup team getting ready to play Australia. You constantly, constantly have to coach. The day you stop coaching, that's when all the methods go out the window, the fancy platforms, the fancy bumper plates, the fancy exercises are no good if it's not coached correctly. So what I hope to do today is take you through um, lots of hopefully valuable information that will, you'd be able to transfer to your own jobs, whether it's PE, youth development, strength and conditioning at senior level, whatever. Um, so we'll have a little breakdown of what it'll look like tonight. So I'm going to go through very quickly the myths and misconceptions about youth strength and conditioning, um, which is, that could be a whole presentation on itself, but we'll, we'll skip through some of the stuff. Um, I'm going to look at the, the current position statements, the most up-to-date position statements on resistance training and strength training for youth and child athletes. Um, then we get into the practical exercises and progressions. So I've put together some little um, indexes that we use to coach exercises uh, to our boys. And no, you'll see that it's very actually straightforward, but there might be nice little progressions in there that you wouldn't have used. Um, at the end of that, we'll tie in with some Olympic lifting towards the end. But this is it's gonna be body weight based, variable modes of resistance, whether it's a barbell, med ball, elastic band, we can, I'll show you how to adapt any of your exercises for the, the things you have. Because I'd imagine the majority of you, some guys here won't have platforms on a bumper plates. You're working with 16 under 14s on a football pitch on a Tuesday night, what do you do? So I'm hoping to show you that progression uh, is easy to, to add in. And then we're gonna look at planning and individualization. How do you put your plan together for the group of players you have? And uh, we'll go through that. And then I suppose the application to all sports, well, the holistic approach of this, this, you'll see that all the exercises we do can be applied to any sport. But we'll tie that in with some, some questions at the end. So the first question we have to ask, uh, what is a youth or a child? So there's loads of different consensus. Uh, it depends where you come from, depends. Uh, if you think of a youth, if anyone plays youth football, youth soccer, it's under 18, generally. Youth cup is under 18. Um, depends on what, where you're from, the sport, the country, it's different. But today we're going to talk about, let's say, 9s to 21s. If that's, that might sound very broad, but let's talk from 9s to 21s. So just out of interest, the United Nations, for statistical purposes, define those persons between the ages of 15 to 24 as youth. In sub-Saharan Africa, youth is, includes people, persons 15 to 30 years of age, because they have a their education system is not as developed as the developing world, so they tend to go to school for longer, and therefore they say you mature mentally uh, takes longer because of that. And in most professional sporting academies, the term youth is used to describe under 9 to 16, so I work in the youth development phase. Munster Rugby is the same, very, very close. I think it's up to 16 again. So 
most academies, most sporting academies will be describing youth as anywhere between 9 to 16. Now, I would say, personally, youth would be um, up, to, up to puberty, yeah. I would, be, I would use puberty as youth and ch a child from 12 down, just as a, as a, as a ballpark finger. So when we look at youth development, I, I've come across this many years ago and I just found it very, very interesting. Um, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. So if you're looking after a youth athlete now, he's going to have a far better um, arsenal of tools and abilities than his counterparts will in four years' time if they're not doing the same, the same stuff. And I have seen that time and time again. And I've seen it firsthand this year, the last two years. I've only been two years at Arsenal. And just the work we've done in two years has, has moved on those players leaps and bounds because they've had no training age. They were technically gifted footballers. They were what was considered elite level athletes when in fact they weren't. Um, so the work you put in, nines, tens, elevens, twelves, all the way up along, will, will sustain your player, make him robust long term. Now some of the guys, you look at the current Irish senior rugby squad, a lot of them now are current ex-academy players. The Paul O'Connell, the Brian O'Driscoll eras, not all of them had academies. They would have been involved in the National Academy when Liam started it, but it wouldn't have had a lot of formal, um, a lot of formal progressive, or not progressive, but I'd say consistent coaching on a regular basis like academy players have now. Like, there's always going to be the exception to the rule. And the great coach, Albert Meal, always said that a talented athlete will always outweigh a bad program or a lack of program. But it's the less talented guys that could be the pros, they're the guys we need to look after, as well as the talented guys. So there's a lot of talented guys out there that get away with doing very little, and they just get away with it. Um, but we try to not let those fish slip through the net. So, quick picture here, quick video. Um, this is what I call the seed. <laughs> this is an under 14, uh, he was a regional monster uh, player. Uh, he came to me at under 13, just done some little bit of movement stuff with him. Um, this was part of his summer program where just practiced a little hang power clean, just learning the movements, um, just learning the basic movements from a very early age. Can he front squat? Yes, he can. Can he catch a power clean position? Does he, is he aware of foot position? Is he, has he got that general athleticism? As you can see, the guy on the right, maybe not so good, but he's practicing, he's learning. And we have a coach at each side teaching these guys. But what it shows is this can be the end product. Now, this is Peter Romani, um, the current Munster in Ireland back row. Um, I know Peter a long, long time. I had Peter when he was 15, and the day I left Munster Rugby, he was 20, and that was the day he got his first professional contract. So I had a nice, I always use him in my presentations, not because he's the best athlete, not because he has the best technique or any of that, it's because I've had a huge amount of time with that one player, and it just shows um, he's a workaholic. He listens, he's attentive, he just gets on with it, and as a result, this was him when he was, uh, I think he was just 18 here. Um, this is a 100 kilo power clean. Ken looks a bit rough until he sets. Nice tidy power cleans. So that's the tree. That's the end of a five year cycle of getting the seed, watering it every day, cutting the bits off, working hard to, to tidy up his technique. He currently, I was talking to the Munster, the condition coach looking after him. And I think currently he's doing like 150 for singles and doubles, easy. Which is phenomenal for a professional rugby player who's not a weightlifter. They only do this once or twice a week for 10 minutes. It just shows the power output of these exercises. Now, you'll know, anyone who knows me will know, I'm a big proponent of the Olympic lifts. The problem with the Olympic lifts is people get lazy. No, nah, they're not for my players because they don't coach them. The bang for buck of an Olympic lift is massive. You should go and research it if you're not aware of it. Uh, it's worth taking time to put in the work. Because before you know it, you have the little guy, Chris, there at the start. Two years, three years down the road, he's on 100 kilo cleans, getting a huge rate of force development and speed strength, strength speed outputs. So I just put in those little uh, things there. So the myths and misconceptions. So I'm going to throw this out to you first. I'm going to get personal here. Um, this is the first one. First one. This, what's the most common myth and misconception about weightlifting, weight training, resistance training for children? Stunt or growth, okay. That's the funny one, that's the, that's the one I love the most because it's very personal. <laughs> I, didn't, uh, I didn't start lifting weights until I was 17. Um, the reason I went into competitive weightlifting was football, soccer, athletics, uh, hurling, 
boys were passing me out. I'd, I'd stopped growing quite early. I, my, my parents are short, family are short. I was never going to be very tall. Um, so weightlifting found me. Um, I didn't find weightlifting. I was 17, I'd say, when I started doing bodybuilding type exercises, below in a little gym in care, uh, learning to bench press, learning to chin up. I took up competitive weightlifting when I was 21. At that stage, most world champions are nearly finished. So I was quite late coming into it. It didn't stunt my growth, I was short. So this is funny, this is a question I always get from every parent I ever meet. I don't mind telling you the personal side of this because any parent I ever have come up to me and go, oh, well, uh, what happened to you, like? And you're just kind of going, <laughs> <laughs> they, they have no problem saying it. They have no problem saying it. Uh, I have my own unique way in dealing with it, but I won't tell you how that is. But um, yeah, strength training with your youth athletes stunts their growth. That's the, the biggest, biggest one. The growth plate damage, that the growth plates are like cartilage until the, the, the uh, kid is developed, until he's matured, and that excessive weight, excessive loading causes massive damage to the growth plates. You look at the literature, look on the research, trying to find anything that says resistance training directly affects growth plate damage, and proof of that is very, 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 very hard to find. Weightlifting, weight training, resistance training actually comes way down the list. Um, there's bigger growth plate damage from gymnastics, trampolining, sprinting, running, jumping activities than there is from weightlifting. Strength training for youth athletes can lead to overuse injuries. Again, I'll point back to the very similar to the growth plate damage. It's actually overuse injuries are caused by training loads, not by weightlifting, not by weight training. And those that compete in weightlifting, uh, uh, proper weightlifting, have fewer injuries than any other sport. So when taught properly, when periodized and planned properly, it's very, very safe. Um, and again, it's not research, this is experience and research talking to you here. Um, the sport of weightlifting is isn't inappropriate for children, like 1RM heavy attempts. Some would argue it is, and I mean some strong governing bodies uh, would say that it is, maybe can cause problems long term if you're doing 1RM maximum attempts with pu pubescent kids. Um, the British Weightlifting Association, sub 13, 13 years of age, sub to influence and try and get more weightlifters in the sport, actually have technical competitions. So they use a set weight, I don't know, a seven kilo bar with wooden disc, and you're, you're scored on your technique up to a certain age. So that's a nice, safe way of doing it. Um, again, the 1RM attempts, maximum loading hasn't been shown to cause problems, but there is, there is uh, concern out there. Um, what's scary for me, and I'm sure Liam will tell you this, is within the medical profession, doctors, sports doctors, are actually saying don't lift weights. Now, to this day, they're saying don't lift weights. So they should actually go and look at the research, look at the experience, talk to people who work in it. So they don't say lift weights, because it's bad for you. And all it is, is down to, I think, a fear, a fear, not a, a resounding fear of being the guy or person who goes, yeah, do it, off you go, the person gets hurt. I think it's fear that, that holds a lot of them back. Uh, I won't say ignorance, but fear. Um, this is the big one, I love this one. <laughs> youth athletes should only perform core, core exercises. Why should youth athletes only perform core exercises? The people that say only do core exercises, why do they say that? They have no clue. Not even that they have no clue, no. Everything, Everything. is core training. Everything is core training. Adults should only do core training. Um, that's, it's a big buzz, core. Core's around 10 years and it's still huge. Core, oh your core is bad. You got injured, you got a crucial ligament damage, oh his core was poor. Okay, he's dislocated his shoulder when he hit the, the prop at 20 Gs and then hit the floor. Yeah, his core wasn't great, I saw him going in and he's back folded. Um, core needs to be done. Core is beneficial, and I'll talk about that in a minute, because I want to keep this tight on the core stuff. Uh, it's safe, core is safe. That's why, it's not, it requires no resistance. Let's do a plank until you collapse and you get stress fractures in your back because Last man standing, your man's doing it for three minutes, but his core's been disengaged for the last two and a half minutes, and now it's just a, a battle of wits to keep him up, okay? Let's do some crunches, they're safe, it's safe. Now, what core training does, and we do a lot of core training, it protects your back. It, prote it, it is basically, it's the, uh, what, what we call is the transmission from lower body to upper body. That's your transmission, that's your hub. That's where everything travels through. If you have a weak core, you can't lift maximum weights properly. You get injured. If you have a weak core, when you hit that scrum or that tackle or that shoulder in football or reach up to catch a ball, you're going to be at risk of injury. So it has injury, injury prevention properties. Um, 
the Chinese weightlifters, gymnasts, athletes spend a huge amount of time on core training with the rest of their power, strength, speed type training. They call it the second back. They believe this is your second back. That's how important they see it. This braces and keeps everything tight. What's the job of the core, by the way? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? Postural alignment. Your core's job, primary job, is to protect your spine and keep your spine in the position it should be. Okay. So we'll, we'll be looking at core later on, and we'll go through some nice little exercises that I like for core training. And I think all these, uh, can anyone think of anything else on top of this, by the way? Is there anything else that? Weights make you slower. Love that one. Love that. <laughs> I love that one. That is absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. The only person I've ever seen to slow down from weights is the person who's bodybuilding, who has just put on so much mass. Uh, and you see, I, I see it in, and particularly, I'm not ma I love the, the, the Gaelic games. I'm not mocking it, because trust me, professional football is pretty backward when it comes to certain strength and conditioning aspects. It's the guy who goes away in the off-season, or the girl, and she does a little bit of extra strength training. And they put on a few kilos, and they're out of condition, and they come back. Of course they're slow. Now they have extra mass that they have to move around, and they haven't done the strength or speed work in order to move that mass around. So that's where that, that comes from. Weights slow you down. Or if you do power weights, you should only do a light weight really quickly. I've, had, I've met top athletic coaches who still believe in that, that <laughs> you do light weight really quickly for power. The power is a... Uh, the gym is for quick light stuff because they believe it needs to mimic their sport. Uh, I think rowing actually, rowing still does lots of circuit type stuff in the gym to try and replicate 50 box jumps, 50 high pulls, 50 of these thruster things, 50 box jumps, 50 lunges, 50 to mimic the conditions in the boat. We go to the gym to make muscles powerful, strong, supple, stable, mobile. We don't, we get our sport specific stuff from our sport. If I was to make a footballer sport specific, I'd have him doing this with a heavy med ball for hours on end. I'd love to see what happens <laughs> to his technique once I start doing that. Okay, so that's another one. Anyone out there? An anything else? What else does weight training do and strength training do? Try, besides slow me down, make me small, and wreck my, my core. Flexibility. 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 That is. Uh, that's actually. Yeah. That's a very good one because it does. Increased, what you're looking for when you strength train is increased tension and the ability of your muscles to produce tension quickly. So you do lose range if you don't mobilize, if you don't work through full range of motion and you're not mobile and flexible and working on it, yeah. So that's often what happens again. The guy goes away, does the off-season program, hits the gym hard, doesn't bother stretching because he doesn't have to. You can get through full range dumbbells without really being mobile through your shoulders. You can push on the leg press without being really mobile in the hips. Next minute you're on uh, the, the football pitch pre-season, you're running sprints, hamstrings going, you can't reach above your head to get a ball, yeah, flexibility is lost. But if it's functional training, functional hypertrophy, functional power and strength, that flexibility shouldn't be lost. And that can be seen in high level Olympic lifters. Peter O'Mahony there um, that you saw, he's not a high level Olympic lifter, he's a professional rugby player who gets, as I said, impacts on his shoulders when he hits guys every week of up to 20 G's for us. Now, he's had two ACL or two AC joint issues of both arms, and he still has really good range here. Uh, the only thing it does affect is his bench press. And as I say, always on when you're on a pitch, when do you bench press? Unless the big fat prop falls down on you. But apart from that, you don't bench press. Yes, you need upper body strength. But what I'm saying is the appropriate exercise is done for the appropriate sport. There should be no loss in flexibility. This all comes back for me to fear. It's fear. It's, it is fear. Um, they don't want to be the guy who recommends that little Johnny goes down and he does a bit of resistance training in his local gym uh, to come back from his knee injury or his hip injury. Um, and companies have actually made a huge amount of money on designing youth appropriate resistance equipment, which is not a bad idea. Uh, there's a time and place for resistance equipment. But why would we put them on a piece of resistance equipment? Not allowed in. Yeah. 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 You can't let them in. Yeah. That's the way it is, and, and that's the way it is. That's the way it is world worldwide. Australia, America, New Zealand. That's the way it is worldwide. Um, but you guys who are working with groups, are working in schools, you can, you can, you can do resistance training without any equipment. The equipment is there because it's safe. Again. So once the person is, say, 16, 
And by the way, if you look at maturation, we'll talk about when it is appropriate to do resistance training. I have 16 year olds that are uh, physically 13. I have 13 year olds, I was only speaking to Liam about a little goalkeeper we have, sorry, little, he's 13 and he's 6'2". He's, he's, he's 16, 17, physically. So I'm holding him back if I don't resistance train him. He's, in the, he's going through that stage now where the hormones are, all the good stuff is going around the body. This is the time now he can develop his strength and power. And if I hold him back because he's 13, I'm in, I've done him a disservice. Likewise, if I put the 16 year old who's physically 14, maybe 13, if I put him into the gym and I resistance train, then I'm at risk as well because he's not ready. So that's where I think strength and conditioning, the, the, the who does work in strength and conditioning environments, I totally understand the insurance thing of 16. And in the eyes of the law, 16 is an adult, <laughs> whether you're physically ready or not. Um, and that's just the way it is. We're not going to change that. But what we can do is change our perception of how resistance training works. So then they say, that, like the doctors, sports scientists, medicine, a lot of common people say, don't lift weights. Don't lift weights. Kids shouldn't lift weights. But then, look at this poor little girl. So that's, a, that's not a non-familiar uh, sight, I don't think. Ourselves going to school with a carry bag similar to this. And this is a little study I came across in the Daily Mail when I was looking for this picture. And what they've done is they've just calculated over, I think, maybe 1,000 kids in British schools between the ages 9 and 11. And this is what they came up with. This is the average content of a school bag for a 9 to 11 year old. Now, minus the laptop, because not all of them would have laptops, depending on your socioeconomic background. Pretty much everything in there is what you'd be carrying to school on your back. So if that adds up to two stone, and I weigh four stone, I'm carrying 50% of my body weight around for two or three miles to school, or on a bus, or whatever. And they're telling us that we can't get a dumbbell and do this with a bit of stability and control and coaching. So that's what we're dealing with. Um, and that was a big article. I, I can't remember if you Google it. It's in uh, the Daily Mail. I um, can't remember when I got it. I have this a while. The whole thing is about the back issues, the functional issues, the stress fractures, the hepatocytes of the hips and the lower back that is occurring in kids from 9 to 11 in British schools because of this. That's nothing to do with weightlifting <laughs> or strength training. So we actually have a bigger job now. What do we have to do next? Let's correct that. So if I have that little boy or that little girl is going to school and then they're coming in to me and I'm asking to play football on an AstroTurf for two hours, do a strength and conditioning session and then sit in the car and go home, there's another job for strength and conditioning coaches. Okay? So there's, just keep these things in mind when we're looking at this. This is, uh, f I think it's fascinating. Um, another thing too when it comes to resistance training and it's very common is the, okay, you didn't do, you didn't do your, uh, your technique right there, give me 20 push-ups. So 20 push-ups or 10 push-ups for a 10, 11, 12, 14 year old is common. You can do, give them 20 push-ups. You might be able to do 20 push-ups, but then you might have that same kid in the gym with two 10 kilo dumbbells teaching him technique. Coach comes in going, oh, he's on the weights, no way. Yeah, but that's 10 kilos or just 20 kilos. You've asked him to push 60 kilos 20 times here. What's the difference? <laughs> this is actually worse. <laughs> or they get you doing lots and lots of jumping and stuff, single leg, double leg, lots and lots of volume and jumping and that's going to cause more problems than any squat or any lunge or any bench press. So we'll, we'll be looking at that when we go on to our progressions. I think off topic, we as strength and conditioning coaches have a huge, huge opening and a huge, huge task ahead of us for youth development. When, when I started out I was working with all sorts of academies. I learned by trial and error. Came into the RFU, uh, this man as my mentor which just opened my eyes to so much stuff. I was a strength power guy. I was all oh, lift weights. Everyone lifts weights. Everyone runs fast. Some people it's not appropriate for. And I learned that. <laughs> you have to learn many different ways of thinking. But what I'm finding is when, I'm, when I've gone to put the presentation together, and from my own experience, I thought it was just me being a little bit in, you get into a job and sometimes you get stuck in it and you can't see outside the, the bigger world. Very few people want to work with the nines and sixteens. Why? Patience. Sorry? Patience. Patience. Just tell them to train in front of me, teaching techniques and stuff like that. Exactly. That's a big one. Uh, so I've, I'm going to be arrogant here. I don't like being arrogant, but I'm going to be arrogant. So I've been at a senior World Cup as the assistant strength and conditioning coach, and a junior World Cup as the lead strength and conditioning, work, uh, strength and conditioning coach. I've worked with Olympic athletes, Paralympic athletes. Now I'm working with the Arsenal under 9s and 16s. Now take away Arsenal, take away professional football. They're under 9s, under 16s. 
So, I was told when I went to Arsenal, that's where you're going. We want your expertise from all up here, here. Because the better they are, the better they are. Okay, that's hard. Why is it hard? Yeah. Training yeah. Basically yeah. Back to yeah. Exactly. It's a whole other specialty, but also the sexy stuff is gone. Yeah. There's the sexy stuff. So I came off the. Literally, I started. I was in a junior World Cup for 26 days in France. Got off the plane. I spent two days with my family in Tipperary, and I moved straight over to Arsenal. And that first week, I took the under nines, tens, and elevens, and that's all I was allowed to take. After being Lining out against the All Blacks in Australia, the hype of a World Cup, yeah, a Junior World Cup under 20s, but that that stuff being looked after, going to functions and town halls and whining and dining, and yeah, but that's where my passion was, and I'm not just saying that. I wasn't fired from here. <laughs> 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 I wasn't fired from here, but this is hard. It's not sexy, and I think we need to open our minds a bit because we're actually really, really just huge opportunity for youth development strength and conditioning coaches. There's probably only a handful of courses you can do. This is probably the only presentation I've ever gone on youth development uh, strength and conditioning. <laughs> I've, got, I've seen Mike Stone present on it and it was poor. It was more about him selling his facility than it was actually about what to do with the youth development. There's the, the NSCA run a short course on, on child movement and conditioning. There's a couple of different books. Roger Lloyd, who's a big researcher and practitioner in the UK at the moment, who's writing everything there is on LTAD at the minute, the mission statements and all the different UK models and strength and conditioning for the youth athlete. He's a lovely book out at the moment. And I know Roger personally, and his biggest problem is he hasn't coached anyone. He hasn't done the 9s and 16s, 16s and 21s, the 21s to the first team. So there's very few of us out there. I uh, mean, when I spoke to Liam earlier, I was kind of going, Liam, all around the world, his whole life doing this job. I said, how many people do you know? This wasn't me looking for <laughs> a raise or a pat in the back. This was actually trying to figure out, uh, am I behind or am I in front? or What do I need to do to push on? There's very few out there who've actually worked right through the whole long-term athletic development spectrum because it's not sexy. Taking the under 11s, 12s, cold winters night for two hours and trying to get them to do your lunges and your little circuits, it's hard. But, but then you see them play, then you see them perform, then you see them a year later and they're just different animals. Whereas with the older boys, you can only have 1%, 2% difference. Yeah, that 1%, 2% marginal gains, to, to quote the manager of British, British Cycling, the marginal gains, that's the Olympic gold or the Olympic silver. Yes, but that 2% can take years and years and years and years. And you have a big athlete and you're going, I can't make any stronger, I can't make any faster. <laughs> the boys, these boys down here, they mightn't be going on to a World Cup singing the national anthem, but these guys here are always improving. And that's, that's sexy. <laughs> Sounds wrong, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's, when you look at that, that is just, every day you go in, they're developing. Every day you can see them growing as men, as boys, and they're just, it's, it's incredible. So those of you who, I think there's a big, big, big opening out there for youth trending and issue. So here's our position statements. Um, in there, I, I, you could, there's hundreds of references for strength and conditioning for the youth, but um, all of them still a bit loose. These are the position statements pulled together. Um, Baker as well, that's Dan Baker, who's the president of the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association. This is old now, this is 2007, I think it's been updated. So the ASCA have one, uh, Fagenbaum et al, he's been involved in all of the position statements. You, uh, NSCA, National Strength and Conditioning Association, position statement. The British Association of Sports and Exercise Science, position statement. Lloyd et al, Roger Lloyd, position statement on new resistance, that's from the, that's um, an updated one. And there he is again. UK SCA position statement, the Cambridge et al, the American Academy of Pediatrics position statement. Now, what do they all tell us? <laughs> what do you think they tell us about strength and resistance training for our kids, our youth athletes? It's okay. It's okay. It actually, it actually yeah. yeah. It's so, now we're, now, we're, now we're over to, we're going freestyle on this, I'm going off PowerPoint. Okay, let's jot these down. So we've looked at the potential co problems with strength, strength, resistance training for the youth athlete. Now let's look at the benefits. So a safe, supervised, appropriate program or exercise for an athlete, a young player. First benefit. So we call that FMS, yeah? 
movement. That's the biggest one for me because we're, we're fighting lack of movement all the time. Everything in the modern world, everything, every single thing is affecting our athletes <laughs> and is preventing them from moving. School, the school bag, sitting in the car training, kids don't even cycle the training anymore, very few, maybe in smaller towns and country they do. They don't climb trees, they're not allowed, they can't run in schoolyards, they're not allowed. PE, 55 minutes a week to get PE in the UK. 55 minutes. So if you're not into basketball, cricket, badminton, what do you do? What do you do in PE class? Nothing. That's the answer. Okay. Movement. It's huge. Next one. Bone density. Yeah, Chris, next one. Sorry? Increase our training age. Increase our training age. my writing. Probably need a archaeologist to insight some of this, but okay. Anything else? This isn't a trick question, it, sorry? Improves posture and reduces muscle imbalance. Improves posture. Psychological. Love that. So why wouldn't we strength train? Or why wouldn't we do resistance training? Of all of them, one, take out, okay, of all of them, I'm going to highlight this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. The only one I've taken out there is training age. What about all of them stands out? This isn't a trick question, sorry, it might be. It increases something. Increases. Also, when you get Paul O'Connell into the gym, he shows up and you haven't seen him before. You know the international player, there he is. You screen him. It's not great. It's also saying, I want to be quicker, I want to be stronger. I also want to lose a bit of fat. I need to play the All Blacks next week. What are you looking to do? Bone density, prevent injuries long term. Injury prevention, strong, robust athlete, less prone to injury. Body composition changes with resistance training. Increased performance, that's the ultimate goal. Improved posture, psychology. A strong, powerful athlete, mentally is strong and powerful. That makes sense? They're the things we want to do as training condition coaches with all our athletes. Now, we're not judging our 9, 10s, 11s, 12 year olds, 14 year olds. I'm not coming in going, you're 0 to 10 is shit. <laughs> I'm going to hammer you with speed training and power training until you get this better. No, 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 no. No. We're looking at a long term increased performance. But we do, you do measure it to see how we're improving. And to see what's lacking, that's what we measure. We do formal testing and screening with all our players. Even the under 9s are burning out the speed gates. Why do I burn out the speed gates? So am I looking at nine? Am I some philosopher? Am I like Socrates from ancient Greece who can go, yeah, he's going to be fantastic. Can I gauge, do I have standards from all over the world for an under nine footballer? No. I put the speed gates up because then they don't become afraid of him. When we get to under 12, 13, 14, 15, when the Premier League are coming in going, I need to pick players for England and they're testing them. They're not afraid of the gates and they love numbers. Kids love numbers. They love being faster than their body and they try to chase their body. And they, we do all sorts of things. Occasionally bring out the speed gates. Coaches looked at me one day about the speed gates. They went, what are you doing here? Like? And we had little races and we had little games and they absolutely loved it. And we don't do that all the time. But what we do is we just see where, 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 where are we? What are we doing here? Okay? Is there, has he got a little quality that we can improve on or is he lacking something? So we're going to move on a bit quicker now. Okay? So when should we resistance train? So is he ready? Maybe not. Maybe that's a bit soon. 
Okay, this is from the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association. This is a little, uh, taken out of their position statement. They believe when the child youth is participating in formal and organised sport, and in Australia that can be six plus. Strength and conditioning, we won't say resistance training at that age, I'm saying movement skills. That we'll look at that in a second. This is just the position statements that are out there. And you'll see the varying differences, okay? This to me is the most important one. When the child youth has the emotional maturity and concentration levels to resistance train. So my 13 year old is ready to resistance train. My 16 year old might be mentally 10 because he just doesn't listen. Am I gonna load him and risk stuff with him? No. Training age is huge. Have they the training age to resistance train? Um, and that's where your, your pathway and having your development program in place creates a better training edge. So my goal currently, and I'm very competitive, even though I'm not working up winning FA Cups, my goal is my under-16s this year are going to get a two-year contract. So they're in the club since they're eight. Most of them, they either get a contract to under-18s this year or they don't, they're out of the club. When they go out of the club, they go down the leagues, okay? I want to get as many of those under-16s physically ready for the under-18s. I want them to go up there and be better than the under-18s because they're ready for that. But that's after two years of a training age. As 14 year olds, they weren't ready for anything resembling performance stuff, okay? So training age is very, very important. And this is without fail. Resistance should be governed by function. I want big, strong, powerful, robust athletes, but if functionally, if they're not good, forget about it. And it's easy to gain strength. A bit of hard work, a bit of grunting, a bit of groaning, a little bit of progression, a bit of, bit of, bit of time. You get strong and you get powerful. But can you remain functional at the same time? And that's the key, because if you're not functional, you can't express that strength to its maximum ability. So I think resistance should be governed by function. Now, the young player, he or she might be very poor at one, say, a lunge pattern, but they might have good squat patterns. So while you're correcting the lunge pattern without load, you can load the squat pattern. So it doesn't mean, oh, you have to have 10 exercises and he needs to be, or she needs to be, bang, 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 five out of five and all of them before you load. I've guys who are very, very poor downstairs functionally, uh, even the older boys, because they're, after going through massive growth spurts, they're tight, they're weak, they're instable, um, but very good upstairs. Shoulder function's good, core's good, so let's do pull-ups, let's do push-ups, while we're correcting and improving this. This is my priority, but they're doing all this bloody boring stuff with me, when their bodies are lifting weights. So you give them a little bit back. They're functionally good upstairs. Let's do the pull-ups. Let's do your push-ups. Let's do your little bit of bench press, okay? But it's all governed by function. And how do these fit statements fit within our LTAD? So going back to your peak height velocity and looking at that, here's uh, Bally's original model of LTAD. So they talk about the windows of trainability, windows of opportunity. And if you see for females, they're between 12 and 15, you have a strength window. If you're not resistance training, he's saying if you're not resistance training in there, then you're losing a, a little window of opportunity to develop strength. For boys, it's a bit, little bit later because peak height velocity is later. So girls mature e earlier than boys. Now that is one model. And, and I think it's been misunderstood because people think, going, oh, if I was to look at that, I'd be going back to Arsenal going, shit, I need to get my strength training in with, with the lads uh, as soon as possible. Between 14 and 15, oh, we'll only wait. We'll wait till 13. Let's wait till 13. It's too late. Some guy's the 13 year old, he's six foot two. <laughs> he needs strength now. If I don't give him strength now, he's, he can't move. So this is often misunderstood. Bally has outlined potential windows of opportunity based on hormone levels and maturation. But the UK SCA models, uh, the Roger Lloyd models, and the Canadian Sport for Life models have looked in a bit deeper at this. And I'll let you look at the LTAD yourselves in more detail, because that's not the topic tonight. But be aware of those windows and be aware that outside of those windows, you can train all those things. So I don't just train speed, part two, and stamina at peak height velocity. I'm training all qualities, but there's room more what this suggests, and this is why it's misunderstood. This suggests there's more room for improvement at those stages. So developing a youth strength and conditioning pathway, whether you're working with amateurs, professionals, or whatever, I think this is key. You should have an idea of where you want to go with your players. And what that does, that gives you meaningful purpose with your work. That gives you an idea of, yeah, what am I trying to actually achieve here? Yeah, he's tight, she's loose there, she's tight there, he's grown, he's not grown. What are you trying to do? You're trying to make them move better, ultimately move better overall. 
And you need to have, I think, a series of exercises that you go to and progress. Like we all want to be able to squat, lunge, push, pull, start, stop, change direction. But if you don't have a little series, and it doesn't have to be what I'm giving you now, it can be handwritten. For years and years and years, I, I've kept an, an exercise index. And I've pulled in and I've pushed out. I've taken stuff in and out that doesn't work. And an exercise index can be massive. But if you have a pathway with some sort of range in there for your team, based on the level you're working at, then that goes a long way to actually helping you plan. Because on the cold Monday night, when you're with a group for six, seven, eight months, then the manager goes, geez, you've done a great job there this year. They're fitter, faster, stronger, less injuries. Can you come back next year? Three weeks' time, you're back with us again. You're back with the same group. Now, you've had them for eight months. Ooh, what do I do now? Do I start again, screen again? Do I go back to here, start here, and go all through those steps again? Or do I go, hold on a minute, I've moved on here. What's my next step? What's the next progression? And that's, I think, very important that any team at any level should have a pathway. It doesn't have to be a highfalutin, beautiful poster on the club wall, because believe me, I've seen them. We've seen beautiful posters on walls that mean nothing. Okay, it needs to be your philosophy, your idea of where you want to take your athletes. And how we develop that is, what is your training philosophy? What is your training philosophy? Anyone that studies here in this building, I would think, should understand that function comes first. And that's not because Liam Hennessy says it or I say it. That's fact. If you can't move, you can't express speed, strength, power. There is some guys and girls in sports who are functionally poor, who get away with it. But there's not very many of them. There's not very many of them, okay? So overall, what is your training philosophy? What access to equipment do you have? Do you work in a local gym? Do you work on a pitch? Do you work in a school? Do you work, so what access to equipment do you, ha do you have? Okay, I want to get this girl strong, powerful, fast. Shit, I don't have anything. I have a med ball and a rubber band, so what can I do? How can I progress that? And hopefully tonight, I'll show you some ways that we use for youth development um, that can help you do that. Then, are you a bodyweight person, or a freeweight person, or a combination of both? Is there a place for this, a place for that? Are you a kettlebell person? Are you an Olympic lifting person? Are you a CrossFit person? What is your philosophy? Whatever your philosophy is, it must be measurable. It must be progressive. Because ultimately what we do is measurable and progressive. We're numbers people. Are the numbers going up? Is the person moving better? Yes or no? Are they faster, stronger, more powerful? Yes or no? Did they lose weight? Did they not lose weight? From a health, well-being, any personal trainers in the room? No? Person, yeah, personal training. Another huge industry that's delving now into strength and conditioning to get ideas. And I think we, sometimes as strength and conditioning coaches, disrespect personal trainers. How will you grade your athlete's progressions? So, is this exercise going to be beginner, intermediate, advanced? Is it going to be yellow, green, red? Is it going to be one, two, three? This is basic stuff, but how many of you here have actually written down an exercise index and graded exercise that you like to do? Now we all have exercises we like to do, love to do, I have go to exercises. But when you're with a, a squad, which I hope you guys will be, or a group, or a, a, an athlete, or an individual, or a, a grandmother, or a grandfather, whoever you're working with, for a long period of time, you can't keep going back to that one thing, <laughs> like it's boring. So you have to understand, how can I progress this? Or how can I regress this? Okay, Johnny was 12, he could squat beautifully. He's come back from holidays, shit, he's grown a foot. Now he can't squat, what do I do? Or, this is now easy for him, what do I do? We've no weights, what do we do? Okay. So, this is where we're going on to our practical. I'm going to give you, I'm going to go on to the next slide, and then we're going to take, I think, 10 minutes. We're going to meet up downstairs in the gym. So we're going to go through these practical, these, uh, these little progressions. This is the first one. Sorry now, it's a little bit small. I tried to get it all on there. Now, I've leveled these one, two, three. This is based on our pathway that we've developed um, from my nines to 16s. This is interchangeable, totally interchangeable. Some of, uh, some of those exercises are just exercises I like to show in, okay? These are, these, this is a philosophy, this is our philosophy. These are the things we like to get done, okay? Sometimes we might get more done or less done, but they are interchangeable, but we have a philosophy, we have a pathway. Now this didn't take very long to put together. This is just a few ideas, what are we trying to achieve? So for your nines, elevens, ABCs, agility, balance, coordination. Does that change up to 15, 16? No. You want to keep agility, balance, coordination, okay? Primal movements, our monkey, our gorilla, our alligator, our frog, all our primal movements are our nines, tens, elevens. Do you think me going in with, no, I mean I have 21 under nines that I take. 
So I've done a nines and tens together some night. That's 42 players. And I'm standing there going, OK, I want you to do a squat. Do you think they're interested in that? No, not a hope. Forget about it, OK? We hide those exercises. I'll show you how we hide those exercises in a minute. We play little games, OK? So we're looking at our primal movements. Then our multi-sport activities. Um, <laughs> I think early specialization can be and is one of the greatest uh, disservices to young athletes, asking them to specialize too early. I'd be killed for saying that now. Football would fire me out. I think the last four sessions we've done with the 9s, 10s, 11s was just badminton, rounders, cricket. We have little rugby balls with dimples on them that you can throw at them, chasing balloons. It was chaos. Looking in, it was chaos. But get them moving. We do a disservice to 9s, 10s, 11s, 12s if you try to formally coach them. Why? Because they can move. Sorry? Exactly. And they can move. We lose the ability to move as we grow. And that's what we're trying to correct. These kids can move. They can all move. Leave them. Leave them move. <laughs> Don't stop them from moving. And then our speed agility games. Our cat and mouse, truck and trailer, British bulldog, dodgeball. We're teaching them fundamental movement patterns that they don't even realize they're doing. Okay? And I'll show you. We'll do a little bit of that in a minute. Um, the under 12s to the 14s changes a bit. Changes a little bit. So we look at anatomical adaptation. So I'm looking more now at formal training. I'm screening. Screening. I'm looking at movement. I'm looking for anatomical adaptation as he grows. Okay, body weight progressions. See exercise index. I'll show you an exercise index in a minute. We're looking at a lot of body weight stuff. Now is the time to, you know, look at them moving. Let's actually challenge them physically now. How many squats can you do uh, touching the box? How many push ups can you do without letting your back sink? So we're starting to challenge the 12s, 13s, 14s. We're starting to introduce Olympic lift, lift, weightlifting technique, which is going to be a big part of their further programs. We use broom handles, training bars, technique discs. We load it when appropriate. And I'll show you videos in a minute of loading when appropriate. Plyometrics, we teach them to land before we teach them to jump. We teach them to land. Growing athlete needs to learn to land because that's where they get hurt. That's where they damage the growth plates. That's where they get those stress fractures, those overuse injuries, is landing. It's not often jumping, it's landing. So we teach them to land. We teach them to jump. We teach them to jump to land. Then we throw in the single leg stuff. And within that alone, within the plyometrics alone, you have massive, massive scope for change and adaptation, OK? Now, when I talk about plyometrics, we won't talk about out-and-out -out plyometrics, where we're doing, OK, Shu et al, 2008, suggested for an intermediate athlete at 15, we do 60 contacts in a session. No, 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 no. It's few contacts. See how they move, how they land. And we'll do that in the warm-up as well. Speed agility, acceleration, de deceleration, change of direction, sport speed, I call that, change of direction. Now. We do formal change of direction drills, and then we let them play football, small-sided small games. Guess what happens? They have to change direction quickly in a sport-specific setting. Okay? Deceleration is one of, one of the areas that's not really thought about sometimes. We all worry about getting from here to here as quick as we can. Then we forget what happens when we get there. Okay? So deceleration is a lot of injuries occur during deceleration phase, so we'll, we'll, we teach a lot of that. Now we get on to the older boys, 15s, 16s, A, B, Cs again. Anatomical adaptation, a little bit more progressive. Individual s &C programs. Every one of our 15s and 16s have an individual program based on their maturation, their peak height velocity, their training age, their functional movement. They're the four things. Then the performance markers are second. The, the only thing, the performance markers, your speed, your power, your strength, the only things they govern is the amount of this they do. Okay, I have one guy under 16, Talaji Bola. Talaji, I'd say physically, I'm not lying, I need to see his birth cert. He's 22. I'm serious. 20, he must be. Physically, he's a man. Like, I mean, he benches 90 kilos. An under 16 footballer benches 90 kilos. Okay? That wasn't my training. He just has it. Now, Talaji then is a good player. He's with our under 18s. He's moved up. When the ball hits his foot, it's like hitting a cricket bat. Bing! So, does Talaji benefit from this? Or does he benefit from spending a little bit more time with the technical coach? Technical coach. So that's your, sometimes as an SNC coach, you have to go, I don't need you today. You need to go and work on your, this. <laughs> okay? So that's where you have to sometimes get on with your staff. Form and strength power profiling. Obviously, periodized plan. Now they have a periodized program every four weeks. By the way, my four week program is lovely. It's set in stone. There's, there's Johnny. Johnny's going to do his four week program, strength, power, speed. This Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, boom. By week four, I see the diary empty. What's happened? Oh, he's got injured. He's gone up to play 18s. He's had his 400 meter running hurdles at school. He couldn't come in today. So that's where 
it changes and it becomes a little bit more adaptive. And then we do formal strength power profiling. But the 3RM testing is taken from training. I take that from training loads. I work up to a 3RM over a period of time. I wouldn't ever just go in and test them at 3RM. Um, counter movement jump, squat jump, elastic index from them too, and then our zero to 10 time. If you don't have that inf stuff, it doesn't matter. There's loads of stuff you can do to test power and speed, okay? Broad jumps, standing, high jumps, okay? Don't do hand time, forget about hand time, but, okay? You can get a fair idea of sp speed potential from jumping. So, we're gonna take a break, then we're gonna go on to our lower body progressions. So I've split them into squat progressions, split leg progressions, hip hinge progressions, okay? So, there's probably thousands of exercises you can throw in there, but we haven't time for thousands of exercises. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through, the through some of the squat progressions, split leg progressions, hip hinge progressions, okay?